But the dreaded gearbox goes back in again. Um, I'm just going to just, just put a bit of oil just to get it all going. Don't give me any trouble. Famous last words. Right, gearbox is done. Um, that wasn't too tricky. I was expecting it to be a little harder. But yeah, that's all in. So now I'm just putting the put the clutch on. So that mark lines up with that white mark. That makes me feel better. Right, a little point on this clutch, this flywheel fitting the gearbox onto the clutch. Um, you'll note that when you fit the components in place, you'll see that the clutch uh, doesn't, uh, it, it moves freely inside these two sandwiched bits, two plates with springs in them. So that when you start to bolt down the outer clutch plate, you tension up the, or you compress these plates in position and they could be slightly off center. Now, obviously they need to be in center because you uh, have this gear, which has to slide in to not one plate tooth, but the second one. And that obviously drives the two plates within the clutch. Uh, I was looking through the Haynes manual and, it, and I suddenly realized to my horror when I was trying to fit this on that Unless the thing is exactly center, you can't get the gearbox on. So I had already tensioned up these bolts and I was thinking, how could I solve this problem now instead of waiting to get a, what they call it an alignment tool. You, you set it in here and it lines the central clutch plate up. You take it out, then you put the gearbox on. So what I did instead, and I hope that this can help you, is go and undo these bolts till the clutch plate is as loose as you can get it all right and then you tap by eye try and get it center you can follow these ridges these these um, slots here try and get them as close as possible and get those teeth lined up with each other and then slowly put the gearbox over and you'll see there's a slight chamfer on there you can just tap it down with a leather mallet, something really soft, or just jiggle it, and the weight of the gearbox, um, if you're putting it on down, will hopefully push those plates centered. Uh, I'd got the, the, the outer plate correct first time around, but I couldn't get the second one, it was jamming. So once I knew that that was centered to the gear, I took it out, and then just with a, with a hammer and a, a uh, a screwdriver just tapped that second gear tooth into alignment as close as I could get it and then uh, with a bit of jiggling I managed to get the gearbox on uh, and once I got it in position then I took it out and then tightened up the bolts so do bear in mind that once you apply the clutch once the engine's running those plates will center 100% perfectly so I wouldn't worry too much about that but just a little bit of help for those who don't have that alignment tool and don't want to wait for it. You can do it without. And these parts here, we're going to start to prime these. Um, I want the frame and the subframe done as soon as I can so that I can get the engine mounted once the engine is mounted into the frame, then you can really start to work on each little bit as, as it fits. If it's not fit for purpose, it gets thrown, then we buy a new one or missing a bolt here or a washer. You really start the true restoration when you get the main components together. Then you can start putting the ancillaries on, then you're off and running. So 
we've got to get to that point. Um, as far as the exhaust pipe's concerned, I hope they will turn out to be okay. They seem to be all right. I fixed the flange on that side, so this should all work okay. So um, let's see how we go. All right, the story with the Guzzi tank is unfortunate because it has this incredibly deep lip, which goes at least two inches down, which means you can't get you can't get anything in here to deal with the dents on the on the inside like I did with the VFRs. Same here. So unfortunately, we're going to have to re rebonder this. Although it's it's only this little spot here, which is not too bad. So we'll get that one tidied up. This one I've managed to uh, bring this edge down, so I'll bonder this so that I don't have any deflection off the surface. The surface has to go around. Having said that, the seat does go over this area here, so you don't get to see any of the back. Which is interesting as to why this is dented here. Anyway, uh, we can save this tank. Uh, I'm sure this side is good. And so we'll just get this one prepped and ready for paint. So I'm using a metal bondo, which is way better. Um, I hate this stuff, but you know, it's a lot cheaper than having to buy a new tank. And um, let me get that on there. Next phase, so we've got the, the main um, body parts fairly flat. Um, what we want to do now is we want to uh, use this. This is called Dolphin Glaze. It's a fine, uh, ultra fine finishing filler. It just deals with all these tiny little nooks and things, and it just gets the blend absolutely perfect. Um, so you don't, it's just a finer paste. You wouldn't think it would make any difference because this stuff is fairly fine too, but it does. It does. So um, yeah, I'll stick this on and I'll show you at the end. This is a lot better than the uh, the Norton. Goodness. So now what we're going to do is blow all the jets out. So take each one out, blow the jet out. Now one thing to do. Uh, is if you've not worked on these carburetors before one of the biggest issues is resetting them once you have stripped them down and put them back you don't know how many turns to put the screws now's the time to check count each screw down up out so that when you put it back you just follow that now that might not be the setting that you're going to end up with but it's at least a starting point uh, on the bike so very important to do that Looks very stiff and tired. So we replace these. Wash that out. And this is the main jet. They're all very similar. The holes get smaller as they're required to do different things. So we'll give those all a nice clean. Let's check if this has got any adjustment on it. Okay, with the uh, airbox side, I'm going to count how many turns in. So, half a turn, full turn, 
one, one and a half, two, two and a half, two and a half, and a quarter. Let's take that out. So that's north, 12 o'clock, that's half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, three and, three and a half, plus on four, okay. Yeah, that could be the idle screw. I also want to take the uh, this uh, flood screw, um, bowl level flood screw, whatever you call them, out. So we we'll have to see how that pin comes out. I think it's just a press fit pin. We'll get that out too. And then this, these two jets here. I think when it uh, when it fills up, this is the overflow. The, the fuel will go this way, but not, it's got to pour through the system. Let's get in with a bit of a clean. And that, as you can see, you can do with a major clean. So we'll take out this whole thing, clean the inside seat as well, so we get a good but that is that's, um, pretty rough. Okay, and that is pretty much the strip down of the Delorto PHF 36BS carburetor, of which there's two. Right, there are many different ways that you can clean a carburetor out. Uh, correctly um, everyone will have a different uh, process some will use carb cleaner others will do ultrasonic cleaning um, they're all good they're all very good I use air compressed air and uh, something like brake parts cleaner uh, it's definitely good enough because what you really want to be doing anyway is taking the scale off carb cleaner I don't think actually kills scale it just uh, it just cleans abrasive stuff material or um, deposits off but uh, none of the stuff really cleans scale other than scale descaling stuff which is you can boil that in a kettle if you want which will also be fine so this is fine what I use this is this and um, I use uh, a, a brush like this with these um, little cleaning wires Obviously, don't stick a dirty one in, but you want to take, maybe cut one off and you'll stick those into the little holes and give them a good clean. And that will uh, that'll, uh, sort out those problems, but that's really what you want to do. Obviously, you can get little pipe cleaners, one specifically for carburetor. You can go crazy if you want to, but remember, we're on a budget here. Not that that's uh, an issue in terms of uh, how good we get this carburetor clean. We get it done absolutely stock as it was originally there's no problem with that it's just that you can go and spend silly amounts of money on things that don't really make that much of a difference so I'm here to tell you you can use various uh, devices this cleaning stuff and a good bit of elbow grease uh, and um, some very thin wire to get into those jets and give them a good clean and then you blow them out with uh, with air that should be more than enough Blow from both sides because you can dislodge anything that's stuck in uh, a chamfered area on the inside of a tube. You can blow it out the other way. Sometimes it gets stuck if you blow it the wrong way. So both ways, please.
Don't apply too much pressure. Air pressure, you can do damage if there's a diaphragm somewhere. Um, I know in the ammo of carburetors, you've got to be very careful to apply uh, too much air pressure. So go easy. You just want to unblock. You see, this is, this is what I'm talking about when it comes to restoration. So you're going to refurb the carburetors, yeah? So you pull this out and you see, oh, it's mucky and dirty. And it's such an important part of the carburetor and you're just going to get constant flooding of your carburetor bowl if this thing doesn't seal properly. So you say, well, of course. So you just take this thing, give it a good clean, and before you know it, this thing is absolutely spotless. It's just got a buildup of muck on it. You can reuse it again. Right, that's back in again. Good clean. All the threads. This is what takes all the time. One pretty key piece of the carburetor is the needle. I'm sure you've heard a lot about these. They sit um, at the base of the plunger and they go in, uh, they go in that hole down there. And you can see it's tapered. So if the top of the screen was the thickest part, that would be off, yeah. There would be no fuel coming through. But as I lower it, lower it, the idle starts to increase uh, as the needle gets thinner. And so it gets till it's high revving, lots of fuel coming through and then off. So that's what happens to a carburetor as it works. It goes up and down, the needle gets thinner, more fuel comes out, the engines rev. That's how it goes, vroom, vroom, vroom. So <laughs> you get the picture. So what we need to check is that there's no funny taper or wear on this. Sometimes it can wear um, unevenly. So you wanna just look for any signs of wear on these. And these unfortunately are just, you have to replace them. But this one looks, looks fairly good. So I'll be putting that back. But before I do that, one thing we need to check is you can see there's wear here we want to see how much wear we get on the plunger, both the plunger and in the sleeve. And here's the key point and the safety of every motorcyclist out there riding these old bikes, is that what can happen with an overly worn sleeve, particularly if this has got too much play in it, what happens is it, it, um, it gets pulled by the cable uh, off center and bends, right, and gets jammed. And particularly, it would get jammed at the, at maybe the open position, and you're in trouble. So this has to be in good order. It really cannot be worth while you having a crash because you suddenly your throttle, throttle stayed open and you couldn't move it. So we're going to give this a polish and a good clean and make sure this thing is slippy as hell. Make sure there's no play in that. But that does feel good. I don't see any excessive wear in that except for the edge and that edge is fine because that's where it pulls but it's not extended across the width of the barrel so I'm happy to place that back in again. It's good to do with a little clean inside there and then she gets put back so carburetor one nearly done.